the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, book of Jeremiah, Hebrew tongue whom God launches forth. You know, God chose Jeremiah before he ever entered his mother's womb, when he was with him before his soul came here. But then God would say in chapter 1, I cho while you were in your mother's womb, I dedicated you as a prophet which is, means taking God's Word and a teacher to the people. And naturally, he said, in many places, he said, they're, they're stubborn. They won't listen, maybe a lot of them. But, and Father's kind of dressing down through the prophet, the people, because they're worshiping idols. I mean, I, on an idol, on, he said, you've got one on every corner, every street. You've got a house that's called by my name, but you're not teaching my word. It is so easy to please our Father. I want you to always remember chapter 7, verse 23. It reads like this. But this thing commanded I them. This is all I ask of them, God says. Saying, obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk ye in all my ways, that means fulfill them, that I have commanded you that it may be well unto you. And that's all that's necessary. You know, when, when you try, none of us are perfect and we all fall short at times. But when you stumble and fall, he counts it perfect if you're trying. He loves his children, but he wants them to at least try. That's why he wrote us this letter. is giving us advice on how to be successful how to have God's blessings in your life, how to find peace of mind, which is the only happiness there is. And, and so it is. So, and we had gotten to chapter 11, verse 18. Let's pick it up there. He had just mentioned the trees, and I took you back to, to the great book of Judges, um, and um, we um, covered a, a place there where the trees wanted a king over them, and none of them wanted to be the king over the trees until it came to the bramble bush, and he said, if you'll worship me, which is a satanic plant, basically, is what it signifies. He said, if you'll worship me and stay under my shadow, then I'll bless you. Well, you see, a bramble bush or a thorn bush doesn't have a shadow. So Satan will always lie to you, and that being the planting that was spoken of. So with that thought in mind, chapter 11, verse 18, let's word, word of wisdom from our Father, let's go with it. And the Lord hath given me knowledge of it, and I know it. Then thou showedest me uh, their doings. Um, verse 19, But I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought uh, to the slaughter. And I knew not that they had devised devices against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, and his name may be no more remembered. That his name may be no more remembered. You know, this, is, this puts Jeremiah as a type of Christ, if you would, where the parable was spoken. They, Father kept sending prophets, and finally he sent his own son, saying they'll respect him. Now they said, let's kill him and get the inheritance. So we kind of have this uh, sign with uh, Jeremiah. It's not popular to teach God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. It's, that's kind of a sad saying, isn't it? That it's not popular to teach God's word. It, it offends many people, because if they only teach traditions of man, you're going to get on some toes. But don't ever, ever apologize for the Word of God. You stick with it. Why? Then He will bless you. We, we read that uh, chapter 7, verse 23. His commandments, this is that letter. And when, when you teach it as it is written, you will always be blessed. You will never be hard up for students. And uh, as long as you uh, 
uh, want to build something, God will furnish the bricks, you do the building. Verse 20, but O Lord of hosts, that judgest righteously, and, and he always does, um, thou that triest the reins and the heart, that really he investigates you from deep inside. Let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I revealed my cause. The, the prophet speaking to him. He said, Father, how long are you going to let this go on? And the, that day of vengeance will come. This is when Christ walked into the church and picked up the scroll of Isaiah. And he, he read into this verse that it is the time of salvation, and he stopped short in the verse because the rest of the verse read, and also to bring forth the day of vengeance, which there's a gap theory there. For the day of salvation and the day of vengeance is the first advent and the second. And so it is written, that day will come. But even today, if you leave God out of the equation of your life, what, why would you do that? When from him comes all wisdom, from him comes all blessings. Oh, there's wisdom of wisdom of the world, and and you should, if you're going to be in it, you should be aware of um, the world well enough that you have you know what that wisdom is to avoid a lot of it. Verse 21. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of the men of Anathoth, that seek thy life, saying, Prophesy not in the name of the Lord, that thou die not by our hands. Just stop this teaching you're doing, or we're going to kill you. Now, there's something interesting about Anathoth. Anathoth in the Hebrew tongue means answer to prayer. It's about three miles north of Jerusalem. Do you know what the town is? The town is a city that God set aside for priests, for preachers. So this is what God is saying to the preachers, uh, uh, concerning the preachers, that is to say, what the preachers would say, tell this prophet to stop prophesying so we don't have to kill him. Nice bunch of religious people, right? Anathoth will always be, it, you know, the priests have no allotment of land. You know, each of the tribes received a certain uh, allotment of priests to teach the word, and the word was to carry itself. But God did give them this town. Before we finish this book, you will know that the deed to that town is still buried in a vase, hidden until, uh, I feel, the second advent. But it's still there. The deed is there. And uh, it will be found someday. We'll be reading of it, uh, and it has to do with Anathoth, answer to prayer. And if you are a true teacher of God's word, then you can rest assured that your prayers will be answered when you're doing God's work. Verse 22, <clears throat> Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword. Their sons and their daughters shall die by famine. Now, let's, let's analyze that a little bit. What is the sword of the Lord? Well, you can read of it in Revelation chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. It's Christ's tongue is a two-edged sword. The truth cuts both ways, but it's always very healing. Now, what is this famine that the young people die from? It is written in Amos chapter 8, uh, chapter 13, rather, in, am I, am I right in that? It's chapter uh, 8, verse 11. You will read there, the famine of the end times is not for food, but for hearing the word of God. And so it is that that famine comes forth, and people are, are starving. Young people today are starving for the truth of God's word. They, have, they are told this on one side, and this good man says this, and another good man says this, but what does God say? That's what's important. That's what you can count on. The traditions of men make void the word of God. And, and so it is that uh, Father's word continues on. When uh, that's a statement from God, it doesn't need a whole lot of translating or explaining. It's straight on. When God says it, it's for truth, and there it is. Verse 23, And there shall be no remnant of them, 
for I will bring evil upon the men of Anathoth, that's the preachers that are there in preacher town, even the year of their visitation. And the year of, the, the year of their visitation is the year of Jacob's trouble. And that visitation is the same year as the year of the Lord, the beginning of it. For how long is a year with the Lord? Second Peter chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one year with Almighty God is as a thousand years with man, meaning the millennium. That is the Lord's day. When the Lord returns at the second advent, it begins. And at that time, there won't be one remnant left of those dudes that falsely teach God's word. Well, it doesn't hurt anything, really, does it? Huh? Well, how about that? You know, when you analyze in the book of Acts where it says uh, Easter, that you should celebrate Easter, do you know what the Greek manuscripts say? Passol, which is Passover. And when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, Christ became our Passover, not our Ishtar. Ishtar is a pagan goddess of a sexual uh, ritual that took place in the woods, rolling eggs of fertility and quick like a bunny. And would you believe that the traditionalists would move that in and say it is so religious? On the day that our Lord and Savior was crucified, paying the price, that our sins are washed away. The high day of Christianity, they bring in the day of Ishtar. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. Oh, isn't there? It's an insult to the living God. Um, you know, uh, it is a sad thing when you see people wanting, they, they, they are so holy and so religious, they don't know, they are ignorant concerning the fact of truth, therefore on they go, thinking they're doing what's right. They are not taught that the false Christ returns first, they are taught that Christ will return and fly them away. And that's the message of the false Christ. As it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, don't let my first letter deceive you. Don't let some man deceive you. Don't let some spirit. We will not gather back to the Lord Jesus Christ until after the son of perdition stands in the holy place claiming to be God. That's Antichrist. So, therefore, truth makes a big difference. It keeps you from being deceived in these end times. Chapter 12, verse 1. Righteous art thou, O Lord. He always is. He's always right. And he'll always judge rightly. When I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are, are all they happy that deal very treacherously? It seems like the wicked always get ahead. You know, uh, not when God can read your mind. Do you think God doesn't know what they're even thinking? He does. This is why for the student, he gave us the 37th Psalm. And in the Hebrew manuscripts, there is an acrostic, meaning that every, <clears throat> every verse begins with the Hebrew letter of the alphabet. Every verse, all of them but uh, three verses, have four lines. But there are three verses set aside that each only have three lines. The question is, why is it that it seems the wicked always get ahead? And the, the acrostic is from our father. It says, hey, don't you worry about it. It may seem that way. But the middle of, uh, verse in the acrostic is, they are as the fat of a lamb cooking on a spit, dripping, dripping the fat dripping into the fire and going up into smoke forever and ever. And the third part of the acrostic is that you're going to be there to see it okay, during the millennium. That uh, Father never leaves us wanting if you want to search for the truth. And it's quite easy to find. A child can understand the word of God if they're not all bent out of shape with traditions of men. So, uh, and there you have it. God never leaves us wanting. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 2. 
Thou hast planted them, yea, they have taken root. They grow. Oh, their business is getting with it. Yea, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth. I mean, they, they talk very religious, act religious, and far from their reins. In other words, they may talk of mean God, but you're not with them, not with them at all. Doesn't sound like the, the word of God. It's traditions of men that make void the word of God. Verse 3, But thou, O Lord, knowest me. Thou hast seen me, this is the prophet speaking, and tried mine heart toward thee. Pull them out like sheep from the slaughter, for the slaughter, and prepare them for the day of slaughter. You separate the sheep from the goats. Well, he's going to do that, all right, well enough. Verse 4, How long? Shall the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither for the wickedness of them that dwell therein? The beasts are consumed, and the birds, because they say, they said, he shall not see uh, our last end. Uh, he doesn't know anything about it. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, you live in a generation when things begin to wilt in the vine. You know, you're supposed to have the former rain and the latter rain. This is an agriculture term, but it has to do with business also. You receive spiritually the, the former rain sprouts the seed. That seed grows. That's your prosperity. The latter rain must come. Or that seed will just blast in the field and wither up and be nothing. If you don't have the latter rain, that's the latter, the truth of the latter days, then there's nothing there to mature that seed into bringing forth fruit that is acceptable to Almighty God. That is to say, in truth and in doing things that please God. Well, now tell me one more time, how do I please God? 723. All you have to do is listen to his commandments, that's this word, and do them. He will be your God, and you will prosper. It will be well with you. You know, that's cutting it pretty, uh, pretty um, simple, where anyone can understand that. Well, how do I know if, you know, if you go to these groups, like he said in the last lecture, there's a little house on every corner and it's got his name on it. How do you know? It's whether they teach his word or not. Isn't that quite simple? If they don't teach his word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby it is God's word speaking, then you're in a heap of hurt, friend. You need to do some adjustments um, to, the, um, to your life. Verse 5. If thou hast run with the footman... And they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? What are you going to do when the cavalry comes? If you can't handle the infantry, and if in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? Do you, do you know? Do you know what the swelling of the Jordan is? I mean, along where the Floods um, overflow and this rich, fertile soil is pushed up in bits onto the bank and it grows thickets out there that only wicked, wild animals can participate in. And they'll chew you up. Okay. He said, uh, what are you going to do when those banks come and that's all you got? You see, this has to do, you must know your enemy. If you don't know what the enemy is, you're in a heap of hurt today. There, there is a controversy. It's between Satan and it's between our Father. And you'd better know the difference. Because Satan, do, do, you, do you understand what Satan tempted Christ with? Well, let me think a moment. He's tempted Christ with Scripture, with the Word of God. There's just one, you can read of it in Matthew chapter 4. There's just one problem with his teaching Scripture. And he probably can teach more Scripture, he probably can quote more Scripture than any Christian can to their hurt. But what he does is he 
quotes the scripture, but he gives it about a 90 degree turn right at the end to make it void from God's word. And of course, Christ knew it when he was being tempted by it. I guess my question is, would you? Would you know when someone was leading you astray? Well, how could I tell? Don't listen to man without checking him out in the word of God. It's that simple. This is the road map. This is the letter that God sent to you, whereby you will be judged by it. It's up to you, totally and completely. You have freedom of choice, whether you're going to follow him and love him or the ways of the world. Have a good trip. That's the way it goes. Everybody must be responsible for their own actions. That's why God sent you this letter, so that he could also love you and bless you, prosper you, and bring peace of mind, which is happiness, real peace, not peace that's spoken of in this world but never happens. Verse 6. For even thy brethren and the house of thy father, even they have dealt treacherously with thee, yea, they have called a multitude after thee. Believe them not, though they speak fair words unto thee. Though so it sounds so holy. It just seems like, you know, I mean, roll those little old eggs. Won't you do that? You know, I mean, carry the little basket. Teach the little children to do it, too. I mean, you know, while you're at it, carry the little baskets and hunt them out. The eggs of fertility. It's not biblical. It has nothing to do with God's word on the high holy day of Christianity. Now, if Satan can pull Christians off into the woods on the day that they're supposed to be visiting the table of the Lord, which is... Uh, which is Passover, which is communion. Christ became our Passover, and the blood and the wine became Christ with us, the sacraments. That's what's supposed to be taken at Passover, not the other. Now, I, I know that many times that's the way people have been raised. They've been taught that. I, it, is, does that leave you an excuse called ignorance? Well, you know, it's always, it's never too late. There's nothing wrong with being uh, unknowing, is, uh, not knowing of certain things, but it's kind of a sin to stay that way when he sent you a simple letter that a child can understand to, to gather and to know how to have the love of God and have to, God, have to have God's blessings with you. Always stick with God's word. Check every man out, this man or any other man. Prove them. This is why he would say earlier there, God, you have tested me. That means like a smelter. Tested that old slinging out the, the sludge and, and leaving the pure stuff right there in the furnace. Uh, God can do that. Always find, let him find you pure in mind. We, we fall short indeed sometimes, but in mind be pure and be loyal and faithful to our Father. They say a lot of fair words and it sounds so holy, holy. But self-righteous hypocrites will get you in a lot of trouble. Verse, uh, what, that is to say that differ with God's word. Verse 7, I have forsaken mine house. I have left mine heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. In other words, this is chastisement. You know what his beloved is? Is the, it, it, it's the children that he, they're his. God loves all of his children. Doesn't love what they're doing. But as it is written in the last verse of, of Revelation chapter 4, God created all things for his pleasure. He didn't create anything to his displeasure. But in so doing, he had to give people free will. Therefore, to have that love returned, they had to have the choice of loving him because you, love is only true when it is voluntary. It originates within the entity. Well, unfortunately, some went bad. They chose not to love the Father. So what he's saying here, I give them over into the hands of their enemies. If they want to listen to that stuff, if they want to be deceived by it, let them go. You see, we're, we're building a people that are going to be in the eternity. We want people that can be accountable, 
that will that will uh, love our Father, that will serve Him, because we we don't want any troublemakers in heaven. And you know something? You don't have to worry. There won't be any troublemakers in heaven. They're not going to make it. So that's why if you've dedicated your life to teaching God's word, it is not to bring hurt to those that would not make it, but to help them make it. Because they're your brothers and they're your sisters. God gave them over to their own choice. Help them teach them and let them make up their own minds. Verse 8 Mine heritage is unto me as a lion in the forest. It crieth out against me, therefore have I hated it. In other words, <clears throat> this is Father speaking. Do you know what a lion in the forest does? It, it'll tear you up. It'll eat you alive. They, they, he said, my, my heritage, the people that I created, that I loved, they even want to take my name out of their vocabulary. They want to do away with the name of God, especially Yahweh, if anyone were intelligent enough to use the sacred name. He said, they're, they're, it's come to that point that they try to get rid of me. They're, 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 like, a, they're like my enemy. And you know something? If you have any intelligence at all today, you see that come to pass. And so it is. There's just one good thing. You know, bless your hearts, we've got a day coming up soon. God set a day aside. You know, we have the holidays and everything. We have Christmas and we have Passover. But the atheist always wants a day, and, and they have one. They truly do. They have a holiday set aside for them. It's strictly for atheists. And it's celebrated in a lot of places. You see, anyone that will not listen to God's word and would rather choose uh, to the ways of the world is a fool. Therefore, on April the 1st, we have April Fool's Day. That is the day for the atheist. They celebrate on that day. How great it is. Father does not like to be left out of your vocabulary. He wants You leave him out of the equation of your life, and you're in a heap of hurt. He loves you. He is a God of love. He doesn't wake up every morning and say, I wonder who I can zap today. He wants to save people today. That's why he sent the Savior. Verse 9, my heritage, my children, is unto me as a speckled bird. The birds round about are against her. Come ye and assemble all the beasts of the field. Come to devour. And there again, one of the, the names of um, the swarmers, the devourers, and the consumers. He's bringing us up to that time. There was um, a great old country western song about the great speckled bird. And from this verse, it came. It's good to have country people that love the Lord and that keep his name in their vocabulary and that love to study his word and worship with him. And I'm, I'm happy to say that many of the country singers, they study with us, and I'm happy for that. I'm glad for that. Verse 10, many pastors, that's to say shepherds, have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot, just messed it up terribly. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. In other words, it's void of progression. It's void of, of getting ahead. They've tromped it underfoot. They've made nothing out of it. They allow people to make light of of Almighty God and get away with it without having been warned what happens to you when you do that. You bring the wrath of God down on yourself. And if you want that, hey, have a good trip. That, you've got freedom of choice. You've got free will. If that's what you want, you go for it. But don't you think for one moment that our Heavenly Father isn't watching. He is. He knows. He understands. You know, again, can you see the love in that of his, for his children? 
He says, the shepherds, the preachers, have destroyed it. Well, not the good preachers. That's the false ones. Well, how do you know a false preacher? Well, does he teach God's word or his own or some little church uh, doctrine? That you got a little quarterly or pamphlet or something you can teach from other than God's word? I, I'm not judging people. I'm just warning. You want to study God's word. Don't leave God out of the equation of your life or you will suffer. Verse 11. They have made it desolate. And being desolate, it mourneth unto me. People that do know cry out to me, Father, help us. The whole land is made desolate because no man layeth it to heart. This word man here is not Adam in the Hebrew tongue. It's ish. Verse 12, the spoilers are come upon all high places through the wilderness, for the sword of the Lord shall devour from the one end of the land even to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. In other words, the sword of the Lord is what? It's the tongue of Christ. That truth is going out. And you know how it will go out? It will go out much as it is written in Mark chapter 13 and Matthew 24 when God's elect are delivered up before the false Messiah and false preachers and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them to bring the truth to the world to bring some out of that fire, some out of that foolishness. And uh, when they cry, when they cry, peace, 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 you better know one thing. There is only one prince of peace. And you better be in his camp, not the camp of the world that's going to cry one peace, the one world system. Next verse to complete, verse 13. They have sown wheat, but shall reap thorns. They have put themselves to pain but shall not profit, and they shall be ashamed of their revenues. That's to say they're going to harvest shame for what they've done because of the furious anger of the Lord. Seven vials of God's anger, God's wrath, are poured out. And you might think this word in the Greek, vial, well, it's a little dinky thing, you know, no. The word in the Greek means it's a wide mouth, short jar. When he pours it out, it dumps. He's not a, our father's not a happy camper. And uh, these warnings should be taken, not lightly. Now, what did it say? Did it say he was going to pour this out on everyone? No, the false ones. If you're serving him, you have a thing in the world to worry about because God's wrath doesn't, is not addressed to you. God loves you. He protects his own. Not one hair on their head shall be harmed, as it's written in Luke 21. Our Father takes care of his own heritage, especially those that stay with him, that love him, that are true to him. They are blessed indeed. They're called God's elect. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldea, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. Uh, that number good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, share it. Once you do that, 
please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. We do not judge people. He said, we, we've got to judge. It's our Father. You don't have to judge. You do have the right to spiritually discern. That's a gift from God as to who you should hear, who you should not hear, and especially listening to God's Word. It's always, it pleases the Father. For his children are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Don't And all knowledge, as it's written in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, knowledge comes from loving, fearing, revere, or fear. The same Hebrew word means it translates both ways. Almighty God. That's how you, all wisdom comes from him that is eternal. So um, let him know you love him. That's what's important. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. We are, we are so happy that China is coming along with Christians there that are studying such, to, where they are the third nation in, in, um, away from America that uh, study God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. We want you to know we're pleased uh, to have you with us. But um, let, uh, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure hearing from you. Now, you got a prayer request, do away with the number and the address. Why, God knows what you're thinking right now. You know, he created you unique. You're different than anyone else. Your DNA is different. Your fingerprints are different. When he created you, he wanted someone just like you. But he does want you to love him. That's, that's important. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. I do not want your burnt offerings. I want your love. I want you to love me. You know, he's your father, nearest of kin. Let him know that. I want your father around the world. We come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and questions. We're going to go with Danny from Kentucky. My question is, while I struggle with finances, I know a person with multi-millions who lies, cheats, steals, commits adultery, even hates their own daughter, and then goes to church. They get blessed year after year. I just don't understand this. Please explain this to me. We'll enjoy study we enjoy studying god's word with you well god bless you i'm glad you do i i think maybe today's lecture might have helped you with that when i explained the 37th psalm you see when somebody like that there's no there's nothing wrong with being rich with god's blessings by you know and god blesses those people that truly serve him in business and otherwise it is those that are rich with ill-gotten gains that have to, that had, they, all, they, they never have any peace of mind. Why? They're always looking over their shoulder. To have, to have riches like that is a bigger headache than life itself. So uh, ill-gotten gains is not a blessing. And besides that, it, God is well aware of it. They, they don't get away with anything. If you have a companion Bible, it is laid out for you, that acrostic I spoke of in the 37th Psalm. It is so beautiful to see the message God hides in the manuscripts for you to absorb, to, to give you that knowledge and comfort of knowing, hey, I know what's going on. You don't have to worry about it. So um, he'll take care of uh, David from Florida, thanks so much for your teachings of the truth. You're welcome. Nothing can make void the Word of God. Isaiah 55, 11, is this correct or not? Um, nothing that God intends can be made void. Okay. Sometimes he puts a condition on something whereby man can cause his Word to be void because they don't take advantage of it. But that's not God's uh, allowing it to become void. That's man with free will uh, uh, teaching falsely and making the word void. The traditions of men will make void the word of God um, to the hearer. But God's word will always reign supreme. It will always be truth. Anytime you think you have found a disagreement or two scriptures that contradict each other, 
guess who's probably falling way short, I, or I can make that a declaration, guess who is falling short in scholarship? You would be. Because God's Word, from the manuscripts, understand me, not necessarily a translation, but from the original manuscripts, or as original as we can get, there are no, con there, there are no contradictions. God's Word is always true. Okay, Susanna from Illinois. My name is Susan. Um, you, you stated that the second Adam was written in the Hebrew names manuscripts. That's how we would find out about him. If it is not written in the King James Version of the Bible, how would Christians learn about the second Adam if they were never taught? Why was his, um, his excluded? in the King James. Also, where the Greek people of those who crossed over the Caucasus Mountains, the Hellenists, some of them were, okay, because Hellenist is a Greek Hebrew. Okay, I, uh, the, uh, back to your question, the King James does make it clear that God created all the races on the sixth day. He made some of them hunters and some of them fishers, he created both male and female. The Hebrew is very specific, and that's why if, if you're not a, a scholar of the manuscripts, uh, the first six chapters of Genesis I break down in detail, and I teach you how to even read the Hebrew manuscripts and give you a, a video of those manuscripts and so that you can read it for yourself. On the sixth day, Adam was created, which means human. Uh, Adam in the Hebrew tongue means to show blood in the place, face or to be ruddy complected. That was et Adam, which is a different man, was created on the eighth day. And he was a husbandman, a, gar a, a ten a agriculture man, a tender of the garden, and brought forth Mother Eve from his, uh, you know, it is written from his rib. Well, the word he, the the Hebrew word for the translated rib is curve. At the time of the translation, we didn't know about the helix curve. The helix curve is the DNA, and God took from the DNA of Adam et ha Adam and created Mother Eve, the feminine part of that DNA. And, and with that, Eve became the mother of all living. Why? Not because she, by womb, was mother of all living, but because from her womb, umbilical cord to umbilical cord, would come Christ. And if you're not in Christ, you're not living eternally. So she is the mother of all living because you either are in her offspring, Christ, or you're not living eternally. Okay, period. That may offend some, but be that as it may. So God did create all the races on the sixth day, and he looked, and it was good. God is proud of the races. He's proud of them the way they are. That's why he created them that way. And quite frankly, he created them in the same image they were in the angelic world, first earth age. Okay, uh, I, I know that that's, if that's kind of a little, seems uh, strange to some, put it on the shelf and leave it there for a while. Eugene from Montana, can you please tell me when Passover begins and when it ends? Also, how do I celebrate Passover? Do I, I, I can't make that, and do I, I can't make that out and read God's word and pray. Could you tell me also how to find this information in the Bible? Well, you can. It's, when, when does the new year begin? At the spring equinox. We are children of light. We go by the solar. You're not a child of darkness. That, that is, every prophecy written concerning Satan is given in moons or months. Because why? He's, he's the prince of darkness. As, as a matter of fact, uh, documentation, uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, Satan has 42 months. 42 months, well, how long is that? That's three and a half years. 
God's elect, the two witnesses, have 1,260 days, days, solar, okay. 1,260 days, how long is that? Three and a half years. But it, <clears throat> in as much as moons cut you a little short, they have a little more time, five days maybe, ten, and, and so it is. But um, um, that's um, Passover then is four, on the 14th day after the spring equinox. At that sundown begins the 15th, and the 15th day is always the sacred Passover. And many, many years ago, you went by 50s, a set of 50s. In other words, after that 15th day, you waited 50 days, and here is Pentecost. And then, naturally, 750s is how much? Well, 750s is 300, um, um, uh, 350 days plus 15, uh, with 350, that's 365 days. That's a solar year. Okay. It happens that way, and you know something? The spring equinox is always on the same day. It's not like moons that jump here and jump there. It's solar. Go solar. Uh, it, uh, helping you read probably would be the fifth chapter of the first book of Thessalonians. You're a child of light. You don't need somebody to tell you, you know. B.J. from Arkansas. Question, is Satan's temple being built at this time, and will he have a temple in Jerusalem during his five-month reign on this earth? Is Christ going to have a temple or a building during the thousand-year reign? There is the Millennium Temple is described in Ezekiel chapter 40 to the end of the book. The book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament has more about the millennium than the whole New Testament put together. And, but um, Satan, uh, you, you need to know that God is putting together a temple now. It's the many-membered body of Christ. Okay. That does make up the temple, and Christ is the head thereof. But uh, Satan will have a temple all right enough. And this is why the day of the Gentile is brought into this in Luke chapter 21. The Dome of the Rock is the place uh, that is very sacred to three different religions. And um, uh, naturally, Satan's going to be drawn to it. Okay, we got, um, who is this? This is Susan from Ohio. Could you please give a brief timeline of events that will happen when Jesus returns? I have heard you teach that the millennium will begin once his feet touch the ground in Jerusalem, but what exactly happens once the teaching is over? Is the Battle of Armageddon and so forth after? No, it isn't. The Battle of Armageddon and Haman God both take place just before uh, and at the second advent. It won't last five minutes. Why? Because God's fighting it. We're not. Our army will do nothing. It is to document to non-believers that God is real. So he's not going to let us fight that battle. He's going to do it himself. And then they will know there is a God. Big time. But uh, the chronological order of events is that, uh, as it is written in Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse 5, that those that are spiritually dead will remain dead till the end of the thousand years where when Satan is released, they will be tested. If they overcome then, they will not participate in the second death, verse, the closing verses of chapter 20, which is the death of the soul. But we'll have eternal life. That's what uh, the millennium is about. It is states in that fifth chapter that we, God's elect, will teach will be priest with him. What does a priest do? They teach. It will be a time of learning because there are many handicapped people that have never had an opportunity to really know the Lord. There, there are many people that, um, that God wants everybody to have a full chance and he wants them to be in a spiritual body where they don't have flesh hang-ups to make that final decision. I know that will seem strange to some. That's what it says. That's the way it will be. Okay, we got Roy from Florida. 
Please explain, as you always do, as I am so very confused, Genesis 1, verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. I believe this means that we all look similar to God. No, 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 it doesn't. The correct translation is God said, let us create man in our image. Our is plural, Elohim in the Hebrew manuscripts. Elohim meaning God and his children. Um, and that's exactly the way it is. Now, a very strange thing in the manuscripts, here you will have in that particular chapter, Eth uh, Ha'adam. Well, why, why would he have Eth Ha'adam where he's talking about Adam? Because what is God? He's Christ, God with us. So when God said, I'm going to create man in our image, he included himself. That's why it's written in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, a virgin shall conceive, bear a male child, and you will call him Emmanuel, being translated God with us. So that's the way it is. He is God. And because he's the living word. The word was with God. The word was God. And the word became flesh and walked among us. So... so um, and, and so it is, but uh, you look exactly the way you look. Uh, an angelic being mature is, a, is a equivalent of about a 30-year-old, okay? And, and age has nothing to do with a spiritual body. It doesn't age, it doesn't wither, it doesn't get sick, it doesn't get old. And so naturally in the spirit body, everybody is about 30 years old. Anita from Kentucky, mature uh, adult. I've been raised on what you call the flyaway doctrine. I've been studying with you for a while. You say it's so plain a child can understand it. I have read over and over again 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 18. Please go there and read the word. Why? You know, I don't know how many times I've got to say this. When, when you're studying something, you got to know what the subject is, or you're wasting your time. You're peddling, you're just peddling and treading water. You, you've got to uh, find out the subject, and then you're going to get somewhere. I'm, gonna, I'm going to take the time here to cover uh, 16 and 18 with you, but why in, why in heaven's name? Would you not go back to verse 13 to pick up the subject? If you don't know what the subject is you're talking about, you're never going to know anything. The word, a child can understand, and I'm not, I'm not talking down to you, but I want you to pick up subject, object, okay, and, and let's go with it here. Verse 13 reads, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That means those that are dead. I don't want you to be ignorant about people that have already passed on. That you sorrow not. You don't have to weep for them. Even as others which have no hope that are ignorant and don't know. Verse 14. Here's your subject. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, now, you'd better, or you're not a Christian. If you don't believe in the resurrection, you're not a Christian. So naturally, yes, we know Christ rose from the dead. He rose again. Even so, then also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, what does that mean? It means they're already gone. They're with God. Therefore, as it's written in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, the minute this clay pot breaks, your old flesh body dies, the silver cord parts, means you break, your spirit body breaks with the flesh body, and instantly you return to the Father who gave, from which you came. You're with him in paradise. This is why Luke would teach in 16 the parable concerning Lazarus and the rich man. They're both in paradise. One on the other one side of the gulf and the other on the other. Okay. So they're with him. They're not out here in some hole in the ground because God is not the God of the dead but of the living. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. You can count on it. 
that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Well, what does that mean, prevent? It means proceed. Doesn't that make common sense? There's no way we can precede them because they're already gone. They've already caught the bus, friend, and the bus is left. They're not here. We are. So naturally, there's no way we that are alive can precede those that are already with the Father. That's, that is so simple, a child can just... I, I know it sounds like I'm talking down to people. I don't mean to be. I'm just saying this is so simple. Don't miss it. 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump, what trump? The last trump, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, the farthest one out of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise, notice there's a colon there, the dead in Christ shall rise first, meaning what? They're gone. They're already out of here. Don't miss that. Then, which are, then, we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds, that means in a large group, to meet the Lord in the air. And that word air is not atmosphere, it's breath of life, meaning our spiritual body. I'm, I'm out of time. Hey, I, I'm sorry. We have to leave it right there. I love you all because you enjoy God's Word. God's Word is so truthful and so wonderful. He sent you that letter. It, I love you because you study it, but most of all, God loves you because you study it. Makes his day, you make his day, boy, are you going to be blessed. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me. You listen good. You stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.